Sometimes it stays here forever. Hey! <laughs> Consent so that's it. So a, these are all of your followers at the moment. Nobody yeah, no one. Or, yeah, no one's but you didn't. Tell that's good. Time. No, I didn't tell anyone ahead of time. Okay. But you can tell your friends now. I'll tell my parents. Tell your friends right now. Friend. I'll tell my parents. I don't oh, know. Look, there they are. Oh, oh whoa. Yeah. So I usually just like that, and then I go over here, and then nobody ever knows that it's going on. And we have them all together now. Yes. Oh, yes. Okay. Cool. Uh, can I plug in? Yeah, there you go. I sent you my slides too, the five minute yeah. video. I just want to grab a slide out of that. Okay, uh, so okay. go for it. Here. Okay. Oh, you can grab it off of my email. Um, so here, do escape and then Safari, et cetera, et cetera. You're getting messages. Yeah. I just like, yeah. yeah. I just put it down. Are they yes, yeah. they were totally. <laughs> Are they live stream Oh, no. <laughs> yes. Um, where's the attachment? There it is. Um, where should it go, do you think? After the Colorado map or before the Colorado oh, map? Okay. Your new graphs? Yeah. So here's this. So no, the new graphs are done. It's the... Um, but the, this didn't tell them this map, right? Yep. So I think what you should do is you should put it right before that. Got it. So maybe duplicate this one because it has a good um, topic. So just do, duplicate it like that. Thank you. And then we'll um, take away all the stuff that isn't them. And then you can paste change it in this. There. Yeah. Okay, cool. Well, that's the mission, right? That slide. Sure. Oh, okay. Good idea. Yeah. yeah hold on. Paste it in. And let me go over here. Um, there it is. Oh, sweet. So I don't need this whole slide. I think I just need this one. Oh, okay. Um, or just this picture, probably. Nice. Um, just copy it. I don't know. Let's see. There's center. Let's make it bigger again. We're missing one of my students, but I guess that's all right. Yeah. So the other, so the, the students are also in this picture. I just didn't point them out because I was in a hurry. Hold on. Yeah. So here's Haley. And then my students are also in here with Jen's students, but I won't put them up. No, it doesn't matter. I mean, feel free. I don't know. Do you think that there's more to say about it? Yeah, because you, you have, yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, oh, I guess you don't need to see all those departments. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, let's see. Let's just see what it looks like. It said League of Women? League of Women Voters? Oh. Yeah. So what, how do I duplicate so the slide? Duplicate like, uh, Oh, did you? Okay, yeah. Oh, you did it already? No, that's good. No. Yeah, sure. okay. I think I might send and our delete. picture from the other day to the awesome group, the Arkansas Women oh. and Statistics and Mathematics. Sweet. Um, I'll just leave these up here. Okay. Or maybe I'll delete this one. Yeah, because you already have mission there. Yeah. Uh, just Thank you. Delete this. Sorry. And then, which, and then we can make that a good font and everything. Yeah. So matches. I think it's the same font, but let's just change the color. Oops, how okay. do I do that? Let's just do the side. Okay. Now it's everything. So the screen resolution sort of sucks because of this uh, being attached to the computer. Oops. Yay. Okay. Woohoo. Yeah, so I think this is. Let's try it. How does it work? How does it work? <laughs> OK. 
Yeah, I feel like this whole, I don't need this whole page of picture here. Okay. I feel like, okay, I'll just throw it up there. Yeah, it's only going to be there for a sec, yeah. Okay. And then it's over. Oh, cool. And then you have the sources. Initial analysis, 1500. So you have those six slides and you're open to reorder them. I think I don't want to end on the efficiency gap. Can we just delete the efficiency gap? I don't know. Do you talk about the efficiency gap? I'm barely going to talk about it. And the way I put it in my slide is kind of funky. But... So I guess that Moon has it in her slide or the slides that we're borrowing from her so I can leave it in. The reason I'm going to mention it is because, okay, what I was thinking is I just have one slide and those are like buzzwords, right? So if they're going to read anything, like just so they recognize those are the sure. most common measures. Ian needs to bring our copies and bring up. Okay. I hate sweat, so they're sticky. Oh. This looks awesome. Yay! And Cynthia, I can send this to you all. Sure. Thank you. Okay, right now. My dad. Like all of my fans? All of them. Yeah. I'm gonna send it right after. Twitter. I'm gonna send it right after. All your tweets. That makes me nervous because it might be Oh, with that picture. I'm gonna uh -huh. send it to my dad because he was texting earlier. How are you doing? Oh, okay. Email it. I didn't reply to it. Are you getting a new photo? No. Just saying hi to your fans and followers. I might send it to my boss. I'm just, I should also set it up to, so we can actually okay, see things. Yeah, I should probably put it somewhere else. This is not the ideal location. Do something like this. That. Hey, good. It's so meta. It's so meta. Something like that? Where are you gonna stand? Do you think, how far away do you think you're I'm gonna land? I'm gonna sit here and then I'll just slide back in. Yeah, but where are you gonna stand? Here. The air conditioner is more on this side. Oh yeah, it's probably this way a little bit. Like there? Oh, you'll stand there to the side, and you'll also stand on this other side. You're still in the picture. Mm -hmm. Good, that's good. Yeah, you're still in the picture. Good. So you're still in the picture. I'll have to stand on this side for more as well. Wow, it's so metal. Look at that. How look how many of you there are, huh? Oh. That's pretty good. Yeah. It's, it's like a fractal. Well, yeah. It's cool. yeah, okay. Good. I think we can uh, make some of these things go away. Okay. Power. Where we use it? Huh? Where we use it? Where we use it? Where we use it? Oh, I don't know. Maybe I'll sit here Where? so that nobody will touch it. No, the spot. I don't have to hurt anything. I'm gonna look back through them. Up. Oh, thanks for making that. I hope that's okay. Oh, that's no, that's great. Now I can see why you don't. That's the only side I wasn't sure. I'd like. Oh. You'll get it on. Oh. All right. Okay. Boom. This is how I love. Boom. 
when you got it. You got the one. It was um. I'm just barely, I just want to know what it is. Yeah. Who's the person that did the, did the outlier analysis of the early person who did it? Natalie? Was it Natalie? Maybe I don't want to say his name too. Just to say it out loud, but not necessarily. I think it's great. Like, this is the goal of the Well, so he did, um, I think he did the statistical approach. He might have been the first person to use the statistical approach. Not sure. Right? Mm -hmm. Where you like learn the data. So that in case anyone asks you about that, it doesn't really matter. That's the Carolina That's the North Carolina thing. Yeah. I think. It was all really. I think it's better highlighted, so I did this highlight. Yeah, I thought it was better because I just I just think I thought about that later. It makes me look better. Would you look better for the yeah, yeah, I think highlighting is better than changing. These are the two things that you emphasize. So. Yeah, that's why I think it's fashionable. And the serious. Yeah. 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 Ye
do they elect Republicans or Democrats? Uh, it's always Republicans. Is it a split side? Is it um, a, is it a strong uh, win or is it usually um, tight? Like, well, I guess I haven't. Um, they're just redistricting Pennsylvania last year. Oh so yeah. I, I guess I'm not as familiar with the new layout, but I would imagine that it's still my area is particularly pretty strongly Republican. Yeah, I think by like sixty percent, sixty-four percent. Interesting. Are you, kind of are you, are you um, well, I live in Colorado. I grew up in Colorado, which is all one congressional district in the U.S. House, so oh, okay. it's it's very unjury <laughs> and <Okay. laughs> But uh, yeah, I live in Colorado now. I'll show you the analysis for Colorado. Okay. <laughs> So do you guys, do you have a place where we can get copies made quickly? I think Ian was going to bring them, but it didn't work out. Yeah, all right. And he hasn't made it back from this trip yet. That's just like, I You have those emails. Yes. Or CC. I went to his office. Well, luckily there are two more minutes. Sure. There's not very many of you in here. What state are you from? I'm from the physics department. Uh, <laughs> Let's tell the state there. Sure. <laughs> yeah, sure. You uh, come from a state? Or you just not? Uh, I'm not living in Kentucky. I guess you're currently living in Kentucky. Yes, but I can't vote. You can't vote? I can't vote. You can't vote, no. Not here. Yeah, that's okay. Maybe some scientific or public interest in terms of voting. The UK might have this problem eventually. Uh, yeah, probably. It's currently an electoral commission which is formally speaking an independent organization that makes recommendations to boundaries that are then approved by Parliament. But, um, so it's not quite as uh, severe as here, yeah, but it still exists. Yeah, probably the system was based on England's system. Initially. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, right. So, so. So if anything, yours is worse because ours is 2.0 version 2.0. Well, you can uh, just make mistakes. And That's true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Something about coalition governments that makes gerrymandering not as much of a problem. I forget the details. Yeah, because anytime you have more than two parties, it's much more complicated. I mean, gerrymandering. <laughs> the whole problem of gerrymandering. It's much easier to analyze if you just assume it's a two-party system. And so in the UK, there's like lots of parties, right? Yeah. So it's, it makes sense that it's not a problem. Hello. Yeah. I'm Jay. What state are you from? Uh, Ripley, New Jersey. New Jersey. Yeah. I'm going to talk a few people. Hey, <laughs> <laughs> so you think I'm going to get into Pennsylvania? Which has one of the worst congressional districts in North Carolina, which has one of the worst congressional districts. Uh, what was the difference? Uh, well, I grew up in the Philippines. But the Philippines, I don't know, but it didn't have some kind of the boundary. Yeah, exactly, yeah. There's still, there's still a lot of stuff. Hello. Hello, welcome. Hi. Washington. Washington, what state are you from? Uh, Massachusetts. Great. There's, yeah, they're currently looking at 
Um, who who has the right to set the districts? The states. The, the Constitution gives the rights to the states, and that would be this party that is in control of the state at the time. And so, by the Constitution, this is an important. This, this leads to important issues. Um, another important player in the roles is the Fifteenth Amendment. So, the Fifteenth Amendment was was um, uncertain, but there was really little accountability, especially in the South, and, and so it took the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So if you start looking up gerrymandering, for about 100 years, there was really no accountability over the 15th Amendment allowing, so what the 15th Amendment, this was following restitution, following the Civil War, and so this gave all black men also the, the right to vote, but you had full, full taxes, on um, reading tests, and a lot of abuse of this until the 60s. So these are some common players. These are things that might be you might hear in court cases. Um, there are also some kind of loose roles. And so these would be different states have different roles. And so compactness, you might see things about compactness, um, contiguity. The county boundaries, often they try to uphold county boundaries unless you need, you need to slip up the population. And then political subdivisions. Uh, communities of interest, this is a buzzword right now, communities of interest. Only really California has has uh, rules intact in for this, and then prevention's, prevention of carrying incumbents, this is kind of controversial. And so if you look at different states, some of them have these topics written into their rules, some do not. Um, some have very loose definitions. There, there, isn't, there isn't a lot of control over these as far as, as a nation. And so those are, those are some things that, you, that come into play in gerrymandering. Um, I want to talk about some of the things that are happening. So here you might have a population. So this is this is representing a very simple case, but you can think of these as each of the blocks is a person or a group of people. Um, you can see that this group of people, so 60% blue, 40% red, when we split them to some population, if you have five representatives, say, then you have equal population among all of these. You might consider them compact. Now, we're mathematicians, but the word compact the states have very different meanings of compactness as well. They don't think of it like, like mathematicians, but I might consider these compact. Um, this is giving us five blue and, and zero red, so despite that representation here from 60 to 40. Um, but with a little bit of manipulation, so when you look at this one, a little bit of, of artistic manipulation here, um, you can see that red wins despite population 40 to 60. And so some things that are going on here to talk about. Um, two common words, so packing and packing. These are common actions in gerrymandering. The packing, I want you to look at what's going on there. So here I have this district right here, this odd figure, and you have this one red in here, and we're packing in the blues. And remember, the blues are losing in this case. Um, these are considered to be wasted votes. We only needed a half, a little bit above half, so 51% in order to win a district. For that district to be considered um, to get a representative, and so that's those are packed in there. Those two are highlighted. Cracking is another term. So here we have you'll notice. So in this top one, how many red? One, two, three, four, five, six to the four. So they red just has barely enough to guarantee a representative for that particular district. This is an example of cracking. Um, the vocabulary. So cracking just. Um, Divided so the blue was packed into that, um, barely fall short. And then packed so that you have additional wasted votes. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and show you a few controversial states. Now these states don't necessarily mean they're gerrymandered. We're talking about, I wanna you to look, there are a few odd regions in some of these, but some of these have been accused of gerrymandering. So we've got Maryland, um, Democrats, so the state is voting 60, almost 63% for Democratic votes. And then the seats, seven out of the eight seats are owned by Democrats. And I'll talk about this one again later. Um, Wisconsin, so this would be an example. Everything was divided. Um, only five of the 99 races, less than five points, decided by less than five points. And so um, those are a couple that are controversial. Ohio, extremely controversial. So they are legitimately paying for redistricting. And, and I really consider Ohio, North Carolina, I'm going to show you a picture of those. Um, very controversial right here. This is called the snake on the lake. So when they redistricted, they did it very privately. 
the officials went to the bunker. Um, their, all of their work was, was very private at the time and hidden. Um, and Ohio is extremely controversial as far as gerrymandering. And this is another example to kind of show you. So they held 75% for the GOP. And here you can see this would be the statewide population and how they're voting. You can see that they consistently hold 12 out of the 16 states. I also like this image. So this is showing you a few examples of how the districts change. Back when we did it on, on paper, they used to be drawing these before the 80s. But as computer technology, this is really becoming an art form um, as, we, as we develop more technology. North Carolina, also controversial. Um, you may have heard of that in the recent news. I'm going to talk about the Supreme Court case in just a minute. So Republicans have 10 out of the 13 House districts. The state is about half and half. And so there is little control. The Supreme Court, we, we ask ourselves, when might they step in? Well, recently a couple cases have gone to court. Um, so I'm going to just mention this really quick. This was in so Kennedy. When I think of Kennedy's cases, I think he really requested, and that's when I think mathematicians really stood up, how are we going to determine gerrymandering mathematically? And, and following Kennedy's request, there have been a number of approaches. And these are, I just really want to give you an idea of some of the, bolt, the buzzwords. So we've looked at compactness, um, geometry, the regions, to try to compare them. What is compactness? How do you determine gerrymandering in fair, fair shapes? And so that's been examined a bit. A number of other compactness. Partisan symmetry. So you might see work by King. He believes that this is an approach. Um, that was also that's been used in court. Efficiency gap, another buzzword. This is just taking the number of wasted votes divided by the population. So you look, if you only needed 50%, then wasted votes would be, if your party won by 20%, then we would still consider those wasted votes because they could have been bigger than another district. Um, also, if you lost and your party, like maybe your your voting population only voted 30%, perhaps this could have been in a difference. So they look at the number of wasted votes, how how separate those are. Um, and then more recently, we've seen outlier analysis. So Mattingly flipped it a little bit, and then currently, we've been visiting Moon recently. Um, Moon is talking about um, looking at outlier analysis, and then Beth is going to talk a little bit more about that later. Um, I wanted to give you guys a chance to try this. I'm going to point out just a couple things really quick. I don't want to take up too much time. But in the Supreme Court lately, if you want to read anything, this, these two cases came out just last month. And so they're really important. They were not hiding the partisan gerrymandering. Um, in court, the testimony. So I think that electing Rep Republicans is better than electing Democrats. I drew this map to help foster the I think it's better. And that, that jumps out to you. After these two court cases, it was evident that partisan gerrymandering is an issue. However, the Supreme Court has decided to not hear these cases any further. And so now it's up to the states and perhaps mathematicians to kind of solve these issues. Um, Maryland was also in that case. This is considered to be gerrymandered for Democrats, perhaps. This is a different type of gerrymandering than just position. They went after, um, they grouped two Democrats together so that they could gain a see what a difference is there. Um, you'll see they had to shift people just around a little bit. It's like only about 10,000 needed to move, and they moved roughly 360,000. So it really jumped out to <laughs> a little unfair. Um, I'm going to leave this up here for a minute. The, the Supreme Court, if you are interested in reading this, so this is the most recent case. Um, Chief Roberts wrote the opinion of the court. He admits, yes, partisan gerrymandering is an issue, but it's too hard for us to solve. And we're not going to do anything. It's kind of it's kind of the the outcome. Um, Pagan wrote a very passionate dissent. And if you're interested in reading about any of this later, take a look at it. Uh, I, I just put a couple of her comments on here. But um, the partisan gerrymanders deprive citizens of the most fundamental most fundamental right to behave to be a part of the political system. Um, so these were this is the recent Supreme Court that I just wanted to mention. Okay, I want to give you a chance to gerrymander. So we just passed something out, um, and I, you may not have a ton of time, but you could also work on this a little bit later. The three roles that I want you to consider population. So what is in front of you is you can consider the 42 squares. Each one might be a person. That person, you know that they're either the dog party or the blank party. 
do need population balance. So with the 42, um, you're going to split the same number of people and you want six districts. So seven people in a district, how would the dot party win? You'd want a majority. And so you'd want four to three. And you could consider that. I want you to practice gerrymandering and try to get it so that the dot party wins for the blank party. And see if you can find extremes. And I'll give you a few minutes to look at that. Is there any advantage to having uh, both districts at all instead of just like, 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 all voting happen together? Voting districts. Yeah, is there any advantage of having these districts and having these people? So, single member. Is that what you do? So, for the party voting, So are you able to get dot to win five? What is the most extreme? You got four out of six? Can you get five out of six? the copies, but you guys, it does, it works well to share and kind, yeah. of, kind of think it out <laughs> together. <laughs> yeah. You guys can use one yeah, in the corner. Yeah. There's a recent one that 
I, we don't have any slides right now, but there's going to be some people we'll be looking at in the district's art page. They split their school, their school board. Yeah. So you all have some dot money districts that you would like to districts? All right, so. So I might have a list. And, you know, I think my letter, you know. Yeah, I might have let the gerrymandering has occurred. Like, I see six of the land. I think it's unfair. And you seem to be. Oh, <laughs> it's just how it works out. So then the question would be like, can you prove that it's that it's actually gerrymandering? How can you tell if uh, it's gerrymandering if that's just how it worked out? Um, and the um, other measures uh, that Nikki discussed turned out the Supreme Court like didn't, it didn't work. They didn't believe that. They basically said like, okay, it's gerrymandered, but your proof is bad. Sort of like your theory is correct, but your proof is wrong. Uh, so the turned out the thing that's working now uh, is random walks. So let's talk about random walks a little bit. So uh, basic random walk is well on the number line you can start somewhere like at zero and then flip a coin, walk left or right. And so you could ask where you end up after a while. Um, I had my class run this. Um, lots of trials of a 10 step random walk, and you can see that the most likely place to end up is back at zero. It's pretty unlikely that you end up at plus 10 or minus 10. Um, and if you go to a 100 step random walk. It's, it's really quite likely that you end up between negative 40 and 40. It's really unlikely that you end up in these like invisible parts of the distribution. So it's like pretty, pretty likely that when you do a 100 step random walk, you end up somewhere in the middle third. Okay, so that's a random walk. But why should we just random walk on the number line? I live in two-dimensional space. I'm going to be wandering around here in two-dimensional space, just like this point. So you can walk around on the grid. Fair enough. Good idea. Um, or you can really take, you can take a random walk on any graph. So um, one nice thing about the grid is that it, there's four directions, north, south, east, or west, that you could go. So you could roll a tetrahedron or something. But this one, you can do it too. If you started out, say, here, you could roll a three-sided die, decide where to go, maybe you go here. Then you roll a tetrahedron, you can decide where to go, maybe go here, and so on. So you can take a random walk on this graph. You can imagine doing it for a long time, and you can see where you end up. Um, so this has an application to redistricting. So it turns out we're going to take a random walk on the space of districting plans, which is a bit hard to wrap your mind around. So let's start with a basic example. So uh, let's call this the state of Colorado. Say it has nine towns. Does it have, does it have more or less than nine towns? But what's a town, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It depends how you identify. OK, so let's suppose Colorado has nine towns, and we want to split it up into three districts, each consisting of three squares. We're assuming that we have equal population. So here's a way to do it. And then we're going to explore the space of possibilities by merging two districts that touch and then re-splitting them somehow. So let's say maybe I decide I'll merge these two districts, okay? And then I'm gonna randomly re-split them somehow, maybe like this, okay? So I started out with this plan, ended up with this plan, okay? So I, instead of merging these two districts, the pink ones, maybe I should merge these two districts. So I merge them and then I randomly recombine them in some way, maybe like this. Okay, so we can go back and forth between those two planes. So um, you can, these, it turns out for a three by three grid divided into three regions, each consisting of three squares, there's only two ways to do it, and I've drawn a three here. So I started with this plan. If I merge them and recombine them in this way, I go here. If I merge the blue ones and recombine them that way, I go over there. So if you turn your page over. <laughs> oh! So if you could, could you please connect with an edge the resting plans that you can get to by merging in the second line? Yeah, that's a thing. That's a slide. If we don't have copies, that's slide. Oh yeah, yeah. You can just use your finger. Skywriting. Great idea. Great idea. What did he say? He did it on Monday. He did it on Monday. Thank you. 
40% of the vote leaves to be 40% of the regions. Okay, so here are some possible districting plans. Here's a nice compact districting plan that looks a lot like what Nikki put up before. Um, we can call this plan A. So there are two of the blocks that are one by orange. That means that they have six or more blocks, and one toss up, which means they have five and five. So we can say that on average, orange wins 2.5 in this plan. If we just turn it 90 degrees, uh, there are no safe orange seats, right? Now there's nothing that orange wins uh, out, outright, but there are uh, three that orange wins in it. Orange has a tie. So we can say that on average, orange wins 1.5 here. Well, orange isn't doing so hot, because we said orange needed four. So here's a plan where orange gets four safely. That's pretty good. Uh, but that's not enough. I'm greedy. We have a with orange gets six. Uh, okay, so you might allege to random walk from it to come up with similar districting plans. And the same thing with this one that is allegedly gerrymandered. Start there and come up with similar districting plans. So remember, this one had 1.5 for orange and this one had six. So we'll do 100,000 random alterations of districting plan, which is a light computation that you can do in uh, only a little bit of time on a laptop. So if we run it, we start here. Boom, that's the first run. So you can see the mean is somewhere between two and two and a half. Second run, third run. So it looks like a pretty stable distribution. It seems like 100,000 is like enough runs to do so that you can be sure that the shape is something like this. And you can see that 1.5, well, it's not right in the middle, but it's definitely in the fat part of the distribution. So it seems like arguably not gerrymandered. Let's see, okay, so how about this one? So this plan has six for orange, and we're going to start there, and then we're going to random walk. Let's do it. First run. Third run. Third run. Two. Just a couple of things you can take away from this. One is that it seems like this random walk is doing a good job of sampling, because it doesn't matter where you start. We started at that plan, we got this distribution, we started this other very different plan, we got basically the same distribution. So it seems like we're doing a good sampling of the space. Um, that's not a proof, but it's a compelling heuristic. Um, the other one is that, wow, these distributing plans are supposed to be similar to this one, and yet they're, this one is definitely an outlier. So this is, I think, pretty compelling evidence that there's something going on in this plan other than just like, what did you say? It's just the way it worked out. And finally, um, remember, we wanted Orange to have four seats. Look, four, look, four. It's not very common, actually, to get proportional representation. So you actually have to try pretty hard to get proportional representation. I was picking a new for your proportional representation being sort of packed. Packed for one and then packed for the other. Um, and so the reason is that basically there's like a winner's bonus. Whichever party has more than 50% of the vote, well, in the districts that they win, they might get only 60% of the vote, but they win 100% of the representation in that region. So there tends to be a bonus that if you have only more than 50% of the people, you actually are overrepresented. And that just that's just how it works out. That, that is just how it works out. Um, you tend to not get proportional representation unless you are actually going. Okay. Um, so uh, this was used in, in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, uh, the state Supreme Court of Pennsylvania, not the federal Supreme Court, but the state Supreme Court uh, decided that um, the districting map was gerrymandered and brought in a nonpartisan mathematician, Munduchen, to uh, assess whether the things were gerrymandered. And uh, she did. She used this random walk stuff. And, um, and uh, that's what Beth was talking about. Sure. Okay. So let me just tell you a little bit about, um, about the analysis that came out of this. So Diane has sort of laid it out. You start with the districting plan, and you can't possibly create all of the possible districting plans and look at it in context, but you um, random walk around and make a bunch of other districting plans, use the actual voting data, like the orange and pink squares, okay, to determine like the outcomes of those elections, and then you know repeat many times, make histograms. Okay, so the, what we saw before was the seats and how many seats you would get, or excuse me, yeah, how many districts you would get under all of those different plans, and we made a histogram of that. Um, but you just to skip forward here. Okay, so yeah, I guess this is, I'm explaining what I'm what this picture illustrates here. Um, 
So you'd start with a distribution plan like this and some underlying voting data. You would um, change, recombine districts to get new ones, do it a lot of times. In this case, um, you would come up with a total of two to the 30th plans. So in this case, a whole lot of plans, right? Um, use the voting data to basically run elections under all of those plans and see the outcomes, okay? And the idea is that um, you could just look at the number of seats you get under each of those, or um, you might look at some other measures that might more finely um, show some kind of partisan bias. And this is where some of the measures that Nikki talked about um, are also coming into the conversation. So I'll show you some graphs in a second, because I know that's what you really want to see. But let me just remind you that, so seats is one way you can think about this, and I'll show you some seat histograms a little later. Um, you might also think about um, this mean median measure, which is a measure of partisan symmetry. Um, uh, Pro tip, zero is good, right? Um, just if when you're looking at these pictures. Um, efficiency gap, which is again a very sort of famous measure of partisan symmetry. Um, again, zero, zero is reported to be good, okay? Um, and so the idea is, uh, let's, let's look at how those come out when we run these two to the 30th different elections. Okay, so here's a picture. Um, so what do we see here? Um, to give a little bit more of the big picture, um, so there was a plan, which here is referred to as the current plan, um, that had like ridiculous shapes. Like the shape, one of the districts, which is in the Philadelphia suburbs, was famous, like the goofy kicking Donald Duck shape, right? It's a crazy shape that could have been broken into more than one piece in two different places by pulling out a single building. Like a stupid, ridiculous looking shape, okay? So when you take that current plan that contains goofy kicking Donald Duck, and you make you start there and make two to the 30th plans and run elections in them. What you get when you measure the mean median, right, is a picture that kind of looks like this, right? A lot of them have mean median. I guess there's probably um, it ends at zero here, but it goes up. And you know, like very few plans have any mean measure even this big. The plan that they started with was way out here. So this is like starting with a terrible plan. You end up with something that is super far. Um, from the distribution, um, when you, as soon as you move away from that plan, you get results that are very different. Um, and this is the efficiency gap, which again, um, you can just think of, if you don't want to think about it too hard, just think about zero is um, what we're going for. This is what you end up with when you sort of drift around on the graph. Way out there is what the original plan was. Not very well explained why it just sort of happened that way. There's probably a better explanation for how this happened. Probably an explanation like partisan bias. Um, so here's what you see for the efficiency gap for that. Um, so in fact, none of these plans were accepted in the end, and someone from outside the, what is it, the master, the special master, um, came in and um, this person was, I believe, at Stanford, um, sort of as an outside expert drew plans that ended up being accepted by the state. Um, so this is a story. This is how these, this kind of a analysis can really tell a story that, you know, can, I think be pretty convincing. Um, does anybody have questions about this? Um, yes. How do we know how something is biased? Oh yeah, that's a great question. And so there's no, um, in this case, this, I should be a little bit careful. I don't want to misrepresent what's going on at all. Because what we see in each of these starting points is a little different from what we saw in the other starting points, probably what we're see, we're not seeing a random walk over the entire graph in each case, right? Here. Probably what we're seeing is sort of a local walk in each of these cases. Okay? So we can't say that our sampling is uniform over the space of all the plans in this case, right? If all of these distributions were the same, depending on different starting plans, we would have a strong heuristic that we were probably walking all over the graph, or at least getting the same, by these statistics, it would be indistinguishable if we were walking all over the graph or not, or getting a good sample. Um, but uh, we can't, in this case, we're not going to say that. What this says is that for plans that even start with this original one, so for some kind of local region, this is an outlier in that sample. So it's sort of not saying we're sampling the entire space well, but saying, well, if we look even close to this one plan, then we're, um, what we're seeing is, is very unusual. And this could be thought of as unlikely, even for plans that are very similar to it. Um, does that make sense? Yes. Yeah, so in this particular case, uh, I would, I would recommend checking out the Pennsylvania paper for some more, um, some more careful discussion of that exactly. I'm just trying to make a convincing argument, not an ironclad one in this talk. Um, did you have a question also? I was wondering if you also have, you want to see an analysis on that accepted plan. 
Yeah, so um, I don't know if they, I don't think, I don't know if that's in the paper because they accepted the plan after the paper. So these, um, these um, diagrams came from before they had decided to go with that one or before that what plan was even drawn. Um, I believe, okay, so I'm gonna say that I think I've, I've heard her speak about this and that it actually comes out, again, not, it's not an outlier in any way. So it's like, seems to be well explained by, like this just came out this way when I was trying to follow the rules. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, maybe I'm wrong on this, but isn't the like, legal position that gerrymandering based on race is illegal, but gerrymandering based on Yeah. Code? So this is a place. Totally. Yeah. So does this, like, people, like the government body just wants to make sure. So by federal law, the, um, did you have? A, did you want to answer this? Well, what we see in courts is often, ex, um, often like your reasoning for gerrymandering is either, oh, I was trying to uphold population because that's held by the Constitution, right? Or it's to keep the the races so that I didn't have a minority majority, and sometimes they'll use that as a defense, right? Because that's also in the Constitution. Those are held up in court. Partisan gerrymandering is not. There's, yeah. there's no accountability whatsoever. At a, federal, at a federal level, it is, it is not outlawed, and that's part of what the Constitution, that's what the Supreme Court's just kind of said, is that we don't have a problem with this at a federal level at this point. Um, and so um, partisan gerrymandering has been, like has some overlap with racial gerrymandering. And so there you do see some, some sort of discussion there. Um, this was in the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, so that's, I think, one of the big lessons to take out of this is at the state level, things can be illegal that are allowed at the federal level, right? And so this um, map was struck down by the Pennsylvania State Supreme Court because they um, found that partisan gerrymandering violated their laws. The Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And so this is a, yeah, so this is sort of a trend that's going on right now. There were five um, uh, ballot measures in the 2018 election to um, try and put into state constitutions and enshrine in state law nonpartisan principles or create independent councils to make these maps and stuff. So um, that's sort of where the, the frontier is right now, is trying to work at the state level on this. Did you say why there are three people? That's really interesting. So I didn't say why because I don't really know why, but this is something you see a lot is that. There are sort of common things that happen with the efficiency gap. Um, and I don't know that I have a great explanation for this, aside that, yeah, like, it's one of these weird phenomena. Like, it seems like maybe there's some stable things that things stay close to, but where those come from and what they mean, I don't know. Yeah, question? Uh, are there any toy models where we have the handle on analytics? Oh, so you mean, like? Like, I think it's some sort of easing model or something like that. They've tried yeah. the, the, the easily model is the only model that they tried that you, where you can actually prove things like mixing. Mm -hmm. But um, these, I talked to actually asked Moon about this yesterday. Like, when can you prove that it's actually mixing? And it's way too hard actually to prove mixing in these cases. So she and one of the foremost experts on mixing, I forget who she said it was, had tried for like several months. Maybe it was you. I don't know who it is. Mm -hmm. No, not you. Okay. Uh, um, <laughs> I never know who I'm talking to. Right, um, and they couldn't prove it. So th there's no proofs, there's just heuristics. So the arguments for that you are sampling well are usually things like, look, I did a whole bunch of runs and the distributions are identical or indistinguishable. Or like, I started in different places and I did a bunch of runs and again, for any metric that I have, can put up there, the distributions are indistinguishable. So you can't prove that it is good sampling, but you can, find, you can do a lot of experience and not find any evidence that it's bad sampling. Does that make sense? So like what we're doing here, the fact that these distributions are so close to each other is the sort of evidence that would argue for good sampling and mixing, as, as um, you said. Mixing meaning you get all of the trap. Does that make sense to people? <laughs> <My home is good. laughs> they're, one, they're one seat, they're one district. It's definitely the only one district. Um, Okay, cool. So this is what we see in Pennsylvania, and like these, this tells a really powerful story, um, and it tells us something interesting about sort of what's possible for Pennsylvania too. Um, so I am a professor at Colorado College, and Colorado is one of the states that just passed a law um, 
making taking partisan considerations into account when you're making the map illegal. So they've got a, a whole process for drawing the maps of the next redistricting, and there's a lot of rules, and there's a whole lot of room for public input in Colorado. And so my goal was to become part of that conversation. Okay, so let me just tell you a tiny little bit about Colorado to make this um, story, for a colorful story here. Um, so here's where I live in Lawrence Spring, for Colorado colleges. Here's the mountains with all the, that used to be very populated because there was mining there. It's not there anymore, so there's not that many people in the western part of the state. Here's the plains where there used to be lots of agriculture. Not that many people there anymore because there's not think, as many people to do agriculture anymore. Um, so where are all the people in Colorado? They're here along the I-25 corridor, which is um, also known as the front range up here, especially. You got Denver, Boulder, um, Fort Collins, Colorado Springs, and then down here from Pueblo to Nevada. So like, this is where all the people are, and I think you'll see that in the maps that we put up. Um, so there's a lot of things to take into account about Colorado that I, I can talk for a long time about it. But for now, let's just take a look at, you know, this is the current districting plan. Colorado, as of the 2010, that is 2011 redistricting, the 2010 census, um, warranted seven seats, and um, this is how they got divided up. And big district over here, big district over here. Um, Colorado Springs is in this one, and there's a whole bunch of little ones in here, right? Because that's where it is. So this gives you a more realistic picture of what this looks ends up looking like. It's not like um, we're not actually looking for the same area, right? When we're trying to we're looking for the same population in general. But that in, in the exercises you were doing, area and population were the same. Uh, okay, so um, I teach an undergraduate institution, and so who's my team? Um, some undergrads. And so I have um, four research students working with me this summer. This is three of them. This is Haley Colgate, Edgar Santos, and um, Jose Monch Castro. And we also have Hayden Mandelik working with us. Um, and so they are all CC students who um, just were really interested in this project. Um, so we wanted to repeat, do a very similar analysis to what Moon did for Tasmania, only in Colorado. And this is not because we have any, any indication that gerrymandering is happening in Colorado, but we want to like share um, this idea of looking at gerrymandering mathematically through outlier analysis with the state so it can be part of the conversation in the future. So if you're from a state that where it doesn't seem like there's gerrymandering going on, great. But like to prevent future gerrymandering, um, you'd like to have people have some ideas about this tool. Okay, so we um, had four undergraduates, one alum came and joined us. Um, but it, I would like to just say that like this, we we're kind of showing you the idea, um, and you know like get some pictures. Going to create those pictures is actually a tremendous technical undertaking, right? You have to find a lot. You, first, you need a precinct map of the region you're looking at. In this case, Colorado. And you need to have really a really careful file that contains the lines for every precinct in Colorado. They have to fit together beautifully, right? And then you use that to generate this, this giant graph of how the precincts are connected. And then you do you use um, you have to figure out how to do random things on that graph. And like there's a lot of steps to this, and it involves a lot of input um, and some intense data sets. And so it, I say us, but really. Um, we were partnering with the Metric Geometry and Gerrymandering Group at Tufts, which is led by Moon Duchin. Um, they, and the Voting Rights Data Institute, which is what VRDI stands for, um, created many tools that we were able to use. Like, doing this from scratch by ourselves would not have been in any way feasible. So they did things like, if I had a really good file of my um, precinct map, I could feed it into one of their tools and get out the, gra the graph for the next step. And then um, we can use Markov chains that they have sort of uh, written some nice implementations of to sort of get all of these um, maps. Um, but just to create the map, we used a lot of GIS. Um, we teamed with a group from University of Colorado Boulder, um, which is led by Jen Cleland, who you see there. Um, these are all of our students, plus the, another one is over here, um, working together in the GIS lab at CC. Um, OK, so that's GIS. We also needed a bunch of geographical information, so we teamed with geography professors at another institution um, to do the outreach and discussion part. We're partnering with the League of Women Voters. And where does the data come from? You need voting data and population data. Well, the population data, that's a whole other question. How do you get good population data? Well, we did the best we could with the Data Demography Office, and they were tremendously helpful. And they actually had collected some um, 
some geographic information, like a, a um, very close to complete um, geographic file for us. Anyway, like this is just to show that there's a lot that goes into this, and it comes from lots and lots of sources. So this is really an on-the-ground operation where you reach out to people in your community and get their help and reach out to national resources. Okay, so what we're trying to do, right, we were trying to um, get, get involved in this conversation before the next redistricting. In case you're curious um, about the laws that we passed, they're sort of interesting, and there's um, a number of mathematical, a number of interesting mathematical topics in here that will you know, any of you could sort of explore and bring um, ideas to a conversation about. Um, laws, for example, disallow partisan bias. Well, that's kind of what we're trying to talk about here. You can't consider incumbency. And one of the interesting things that these laws require is maximizing competitiveness in some way. So that's not something that we're going to talk about here as far as future directions go. How do you measure competitiveness, right, of possible district plans? What is that even going to be? Um, okay, so we want to participate in the next redistricting, but what we, in order to do that, we need to get the conversation started by maybe doing some analysis of what's out there right now. Okay, so I'll show you first the results of a toy example. You started out by making 1,500 districting plans and using election data from the 2018 races. Okay, and these are examples of some plans. I'll show you some more in a second. And what we did is we just ran those races. And then we I'll show you what how many seats each party got under these analyses and how many um, and like to show you the other partisan measures. Okay, so here just for example are some of the maps that were generated by doing a random walk along the um, metagraph that they end up Um here's one, here's one, okay. They're all it's kind of funny how they all end up without like they're they're changing a lot from step to step. These are like maybe a hundred steps in between each one, they end up having some things in common. So for example, having a giant district to the east and a giant district to the west is just kind of stuck in the geography in some ways because that's where people, um, that's where there's a lot of space and not very many people. Okay, so those are a bunch of maps that we had. How did it come out? Well, let me explain something um, very quickly. So we didn't use data from congressional elections to do our analysis. What we, the, the reason that we didn't use data from actual congressional elections is because in some districts they have incumbents and in some districts they don't. And anybody want to um, hazard a guess at um, how likely you are to be reelected if you're an incumbent? So the incumbent is already in there, right? And if somebody runs against them, um, what's the probability just like based on, you know, taking all of the elections that you can look at that that incumbent will stay in office? Okay, so 10% so that they'll get kicked out, 95 that they'll stay, those are both actually pretty good guesses. It's about 90%. Like, if you're an incumbent, you're going to get reelected, most likely, right? Um, and so the, um, if we were to use data from the um, actual congressional races, then what, that's what we would see. We would see things that were different across districts that were related to incumbency. So what do we do? We take a down-ballot race, in this case, Secretary of State, right? And use this as a sort of proxy for party voting, right? And we did it with several. We did the Secretary of State, Attorney General, we did the Governor, um, even though that might have more personality effects. But basically we're using statewide races to um, sort of be people's party here. So to assign the origin pink squares, that's how we're doing What's that? What is, um, I don't know, the yeah. from blood equals that's a great question. Um, so we decided that, or so the idea was that because of the statewide effect, since this effect was the same statewide, and we're looking at just sort of relative, um, we're looking at how things fare um, relative relative to other plans, um, it didn't matter so much if there was an incumbency effect in one of these, because if the whole um, if the whole uh, ensemble was shifted to the left or to the right a little bit, it wouldn't matter based on that incumbency. What we're looking for is how do you do relative to that whole space of plans. Um, in this case, what we saw is, um, as far as incumbency goes, people don't really know who the Attorney General is or the Secretary of State is anyway. And so there wasn't that much variation between um, different races. Um, but we did several races so that we could sort of compare the races to one another to see like which one best reflected the outcomes that we saw um, when we uh, looked at the actual seats and things like this. Um, yeah, so here, for example, in, in reality, 
you get four, we had four Democratic representatives and three Republican representatives. So when we use the Secretary of State data, like we just pretend like people voted for representatives as they voted for Secretary of State, what we see is that um, if you use the Secretary of State election, you get four Democratic seats, just like the actual congressional races came out. Okay? Um, and so, it, you know, at least at that very rough level, using the Secretary of State data was just, you know, like sim gave us the same outcome as using the actual congressional vote would have. Um, okay, so when you do this, what you see is, so for 1500 plans, the most common outcome is exactly what happened, right? Mostly we got four Democratic seats. There were a few plans that gave three Democratic seats and a few plans that gave five Democratic seats. Um, the mean of the plans that we ran gave us 3.75, Kind of rounds to four, seems like the outcome of four is definitely not that exceptional by this measure. You know, doesn't seem to be an outlier in any way. Um, if you look at the mean median measure, again, this is only 1,500 plans. You don't get a beautiful bell curve like you saw in Moon's data, but you do get uh, sort of an indication of the spread, and we're sort of in the middle of it. It doesn't look like an outlier initially here. Similarly for mean median, okay? Is that green, or sorry, efficiency gap. Is this making sense to everybody? Okay, so this is the initial analysis, analysis that we did, and this is all I had two days ago when we gave this talk for the first time, but my student who was working on this at home just sent me some new data, so hot off the presses, we did some further analysis. So this represents 10,000 plants, okay? And this is kind of intense when you look at it, right? You use the Secretary of State data, and you run um, 10,000 plans with some minimal restriction, like you need equal population, contiguity, um, they're, they're relatively compact. We, I could show you some information on that. But like the idea is here's 10,000 possible plants. Look at this. In like 95% of them, you end up with four seats. So it seems like four seats is like not weird and things are looking good. Okay? Um, as far as the um, mean median score, you start to see something that's not exactly a bell curve, but looks more similar to what um, we've had in her analysis, kind of a slanted bell curve here. And what you can again see is that the, um, the enacted plan and the mean of the ensemble are sort of in the middle of this. Like nothing seems remarkable here, exactly as we expected nothing to seem remarkable. Um, similarly with the efficiency gap, we sort of line up again. Okay, so I'm sorry, I'll leave that up for just a second. Okay, so what is the point of this? Well, the point of this is that this is, um, this is an analysis that um, you can use to really understand in context what's possible for a state given the actual political geography where people live and how they vote and the physical geography of the state that you're trying to preserve um, uh, boundaries that are already there. And um, that it can, it can be uh, done by people like me who are sort of just coming at it um, from the, you know, with a group of determined students like yourselves and your um, group leaders who are interested in exploring this. And, it can indicate, it can be a really strong analysis to tell a story when something's wrong. It can also help us like sort of think about what's possible even when nothing does seem to be wrong, as in Colorado with this particular race. Um, okay, so I think that's all I have to say. Um, any questions for any of us? Yes. So, um, dumb question, probably. Could, could oh, yeah. Could just judge the fairness of the education plan by how well it respects the popular vote? Well, that's an interesting question. So, so when you talk about fairness, I'll let you guys answer too, but I love thinking about this one. So, when you, when you think about fairness, like, we think, like, okay, proportionality should represent the popular vote. That's, like, a perfectly fine idea of fairness to have. But I think what we see here is that for, um, for single-member districts, it's not realistic to expect fairness if you also draw the lines impartially. So what does fair mean? It might mean proportionality, it might mean that you did this impartially. If you do it impartially, like just kind of cut things up in some random way, you're very unlikely to get proportionality. So the idea is that you have two ideas of fairness that sort of don't really line up with each other. So the, this, this whole study will get you thinking a lot about what does fair really mean. You want proportionality, single member districts are just not a reasonable way to get that, not a, not a usual outcome. Like we saw, four was like nowhere close to a common thing in common plans. 
also something that the Supreme Court justices uh, were confused about because they kept thinking, they kept saying, think, like, surely you mean by fair, surely you mean proportional representation. And you have to say, no, no, fair is not proportional. Fair is like somewhere in the middle of the bell curve. So it's proportional representation is nowhere written in as a goal, although it is certainly something that you kind of want, but it's not it's it's not written in any of the state. I think the states that say you have to be compact, you have to respect communities of interest. None of the states say even put proportional representation as a goal. Something that really surprised me and in working with all of this is that it's coming down to also the length of the population and in some in some um, how population is grouped can affect proportionality and whatever is possible as well. And it tends to lead to democratic underrepresentation because there are many places in the country where they're basically 100% Democrat. But there are barely any places, maybe not in the country, that are 100% Republican. So Democrats sort of waste their votes by sprinkling them out in different areas, and so they're not ever going to get proportional representation. Sure. Oh, sorry. Communities of interest. Yeah, communities of interest. So that's the best job. The best state doing a good job with that is California, and other states are working on it a bit right now. But California has a recruiting process, and they pick people from um, different demographics. They pick people from different jobs, and so they build a group to get um, kind of to get their opinions on the areas. And California is really the only state that has actual is doing a good job of that. Other states really haven't written much into their so what, they, what they do is they have people go out and say, you, tell me about a community of interest. And you say, well, um, you know, I have a horse and all my, my grandchildren are nearby and we're all in horses. And the person says, okay, draw me a polygon on the map around your community of horse people. You draw a polygon. You're the next person. And you say, do you have a community of interest? And you're like, yeah, all of us like shooting guns and hunting stuff. <laughs> like, okay, here's a map, draw a polygon. And so the outcome of this thing, the, the method of this thing is town hall meetings, and the outcome of this thing is a collection of polygons on the map. And that's how, and then the, the person committee that draws the maps is supposed to try, when possible, to keep these polygons in fact and not split. Yeah, communities of interest are supposed to stay together. But again, there's very little account. No plans are going to be struck down because they're not And this is also like unclear if this is even the best way to identify real communities of interest. Because I think I personally have a terrible idea of geographically where people live that share some of my um, that share some of my needs, right? Like my community of interest might be people that work where I work, but they live spread out all over the place. And like I'm gonna like draw a circle around where I work, but really the people don't live there at all. So yeah, and in um, Colorado, water is a really big issue. Like, where are we, how are we going to drink in water in 20 years, right? And also, water pollution is a big issue with such people, right? If people are cracking and they um, sort of contaminate uh, an aquifer, like that's a big problem. And so, you might want to have people who all share an aquifer or who share a watershed um, to be um, grouped together as community of interest. But which person are you going to walk up to that's going to circle their watershed, right, as their community of interest? Like, probably. Not me. I have no idea where my water should be. But like, there's some. It's like really hard to think about the best way to identify community of interest. And like, they're called California is trying hard, but you know. So sort of related to that. I'm, so I'm in Maryland right now, which is one of these things that obviously very gerrymandering when you look at it. And my like city is maybe the third biggest in Maryland right now. But it's kind of this nexus point where a whole bunch of different districts kind of spiral into a point, and it definitely feels like. We don't have a representative because there's four different districts, and well, that's you, you, everyone is centered off in another part of the state. Yeah. And I see the same thing happening in Colorado. You know, you've got Denver, which is the popular, and yeah. lots of these districts tend to have this long tendril that reaches in to get enough population from Denver, and then Denver's kind of split up into well, there's this part. That, so, how do you avoid that? Well, I mean, nothing to do with partisanship, but it's also like how do you deal with the fact that you know, populations are uniformly distributed, and you don't want to just me a lot these larger cities in order to yeah. make sure that everything else is equivalent. So yeah. some of them say you can say so some of them say you should respect political boundaries, such as towns and counties. 
town, there's a definition of a town, right? This is, uh, the town of uh, Swarthmore has a boundary around it. There's a definition of a county. Delaware County has a boundary around it. How about the city of New Haven? They, that one, is that one well defined? There's a boundary around that? Okay, the city of Denver. Not well defined. So this is actually something that Lou was talking about the other day, that um, it's a city. What is the city? Is it just the city limits? Is this is the city and its um, outlying bits? Like in Boston, there's Boston and there's Cambridge. There's also Alston, which is technically Boston, but not Boston. Like, it's actually very hard to define a city. So where would you draw the line? If you don't have a polygon, you don't have a thing that people can program in to take uh, together. So it's a problem. Garrett Nelson, a geographer from Dartmouth, had a really interesting paper that came out within the last couple of years where they're looking at, um, so I think they use cell phones to track people commuting, and, and that kind of gave an idea of where cities, and that was something else used for commuting, which is that was kind of interesting. So th those are current ideas. Thank you.